When is it time to stop? I am going to murder whoever is walking down those stairs. Just so you know, I know who it is. I know it was you. I didn't know you were recording. I thought I told you. I'm going to put what you're saying right now in the video as a testament yeah, to that? your sins. Can I run it? Can I run? No. I'm just kidding. Can I run? Can yeah, you, you can run. run. No, I can't hear you run. Okay. Sorry. I love you. <laughs> I should put that in the video. When is it? Time to stop. Madden and Just Dance don't seem to get the memo. Monster Hunter and Dynasty Warriors get closer, though, because even though there are stacks of sequels, they come out over long periods of time to prevent stagnation. On the other hand, you have franchises like Assassin's Creed and Guitar Hero that both learned the hard way that you can't ride the coattails of success forever. Especially with yearly releases that don't really innovate on the formulas. And while Assassin's Creed has recovered from that pretty well, Guitar Hero is another story because even though, despite its admirable efforts, it failed. That's the kind of situation and uncertain future that was ahead of God of War. Because after God of War 3, where do you go from there? What more can you do to retain an iconic formula without straying too far? No matter how fun, do some franchises have seemingly undying life whereas others naturally lose steam? Santa Monica Studios' answer took form with Ascension and proved the latter for the franchise. It wasn't even a proper send-off according to the general gaming community. I've often heard that Ascension is plain unnecessary with a poor story and frustrating combat, so I prepped for the worst with this swan song for Kratos. Is it truly the worst God of War game? In a couple ways, yeah. But is it a bad game? If you've paid attention to Santa Monica's consistent track record, I'd argue a team could never make such an egregious misstep. And Ascension is no exception, with some caveats. However, I see why people are quick to pounce. I was over the franchise by the time I got to Ascension because I had had my fill of everything that could be done. From the first game to God of War 3, nearly all of my major complaints and suggestions for improvement had been addressed, so any further installments felt ancillary. Ready at Dawn's contributions avoided this trap with compelling standalone adventures that came in during the series' heyday. Three years later, Ascension is an odd one out, burdened by the weight of expectation, a product of misplaced focuses and mixed execution. Yet its positive critical reception at release contrasted with most of the disdain that people have for the game these days really illustrates my frustrations with people almost being blinded to some of the ways in which I think Ascension actually elevates elements of God of War to their greatest potential. You may be wondering, how can this be? <laughs> well, before we get into that, let's take a look into Ascension's development as always. Santa Monica was considering new projects after God of War 3. It's only expected since anyone would be worn out working within the confines of the same world and gameplay for nearly a decade. But the team, much like Ready at Dawn with Ghost of Sparta, felt the urge to give one last hurrah by telling the story of how Kratos broke his bond with Ares. The Spartan was in the Olympians' service by the time of Chains of Olympus, so how on earth did a mortal achieve this? 
It paved the way for exploring more gods and locations, but the prequel premise didn't solely drive Ascension's conception. There's been challenge modes in every God of War that haven't been worth mentioning in my reviews. They're brief, fun distractions with unique arenas that give you time limits, limitations, or strange objectives to fight outside the box. The third game had a special arena taking place atop Mount Olympus called the Challenge of Exile. The trials conclude with a shocking one-on-one -on -one duel with Fear Kratos, the black nebulous version you play as when Zeus forces Kratos to confront his memories and guilt in the campaign. Lead combat designer Adam Poole is the culprit for this encounter, which got the whole studio wondering, what if we could turn this into multiplayer? The early 2010s were a weird time when single player developers, um, or their publishers, became eager to tap into the multiplayer craze. You'd see curious forays into online play with Dead Space 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Max Payne 3, Spec Ops The Line, and Bioshock 2. But more often than not, even the surprisingly good takes didn't have lasting vigor. Just like most gamers, I was disappointed that studios were pooling time and talent away from core experiences to deliver competitive slash cooperative modes no one asked for. The same concern broadly categorized the initial response to Ascension. Ready at Dawn actually considered multiplayer for Chains of Olympus and obviously shut that down. But could this game deliver on that ambition? It was new ground for Santa Monica that brought the team back to the old, intimidating territory of the unknown they'd faced with the first God of War. Fresh faces were needed with experience in coding, designing, and balancing multiplayer. Old Blood had to overhaul and expand upon the single player mechanics with new weapons and abilities. The team wavered on whether the game should be co op or competitive up until the alpha build and eventually went for both. While leadership was better regulated, it was detrimentally split between two worlds. Senior producer Whitney Wade and director of internal development Chaco Sony discussed how game director Todd Pappy was caught between a rock and a hard place. When the multiplayer needed focus, the single player went on the back burner, and then the opposite happened after E3 2012. But who's Pappy? Todd Pappy started his game development career in 1996 as an artist for San Francisco Rush at Midway San Jose. He continued with the 1998 sequel Rush 2 Extreme Racing USA and uh, San Francisco Rush 2049 the following year. Yeah, those games sound pretty cool. He became a designer for Dr. Mudo a strange 3D platformer with side-scrolling and first-person elements where you transform into various creatures as a mad scientist, and you may recognize that game from my God of War 3 review because director Stig Asmussen also worked on Dr. Mudo as a lead level artist. From there, along with a couple other friends like Stig, Pappy came onto God of War a year into its development as a senior designer. He actually made a 15-month exodus to work with Paradigm Entertainment on Battlezone for the PSP before returning to a similar role for God of War 2. Like past directors, he rose within his department to become a design director for God of War 3 and took the director's chair for Ascension. We've had artists, Asmuzin and Rui Wieroesaria, a producer, David Jaffe, uh, that's hard to put a label on him, <laughs> and designers, Dan Jan and Pappy work on the God of War franchise as directors. One of the goals he brought to the table was, quote, to take God of War and distill it down to an essence, end quote. He not only wanted to home in on what made the gameplay tick, but also bring more humanity and quiet moments to this entry. Unfortunately, there's not much else to go on to see how these principles guided the campaign's production. Most of Ascension's internally filmed documentary was focused on the development pipeline of multiplayer maps and mechanics. The game released on March 12, 2013 for the PlayStation 3 with favorable reception, but it sold poorly like Ghosts of Sparta. Whereas God of War 3 sold over 5.2 million worldwide, the numbers for Ascension approximate to 2.4 million. God of War 3 sold over a million during its first month, and Ascension around half as much. 
This is even worse considering how the game had a $50 million budget compared to God of War 3's $44 million. Fortunately for Santa Monica, the multiplayer was positively received by a small yet committed community. DLC nevertheless ceased production that year in October with ongoing patching that lasted for a little while longer. Todd Pappy also left Santa Monica later that year to work on Star Citizen with Cloud Emporium Games as a design director in Frankfurt, Germany. He's still there today. And Star Citizen is still in development as well. It'll likely always be in development, but I don't know. That's none of my business. <laughs> uh, oh no. Anyway, Ascension is a fascinating, if imperfect, anomaly because of its divided approach. And I'd definitely be remiss if I were to ignore its stressed multiplayer component. So... No thanks. I remember Dead Space 3. I want to pass on the online pass. <laughs> uh, uh, God, forgive me. Oh. I'm doing this for you, for posterity's sake. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, I played a few hours of its modes for the sake of being thorough with my criticism. Besides, I was curious to see if my God of War skills from playing on harder difficulties translated well to the space. Hmm, did they? You're a warrior that's been saved by the gods from the imprisonment of the Furies. You align yourself with Hades, Ares, Zeus, or Poseidon to gain exclusive magic abilities and items. Whereas Hades is more suited for a mode like Capture the Flag since adherents can turn invisible and increase their speed, Poseidon is better for team players since they can bolster defense and restore health. You can switch allegiances at any time to acclimate to the difficulties a mode or opposition poses. But if you stay committed and play well within a role, You'll receive favor, which is XP, and skill points from the gods to unlock new armor, weapons, items, magic, and relics. All of these are different across allegiances, such as exclusive versions of weapons like the hammer or sword that have effects attuned to your role. Without getting into the mess that is all the abilities, items, magic, and relics, let's just say they accommodate the roles of each allegiance which prompts you to switch to, say, Zeus or Ares with Free For All and Poseidon or Hades with cooperative modes. It's overwhelming at first with all the options presented to you, but if you take time with each allegiance, you'll quickly know how to best serve yourself and teammates. One thing for sure is that players who are higher levels have clear advantages with increased stats and late game abilities. Having any hope of climbing the ranks, with one allegiance, mind you, would take a good dozen hours, especially with internalizing combos and particular kits that work best. There are legendary weapons to purchase that I initially thought were pay to win, but thankfully you can acquire every set through play by completing labors, which adds incentive to replaying certain modes, assuming particular allegiances, and so forth. Where do you perform these labors? You've got death matches, team-based and free-for-all, capture the flag, and two unique co-op modes. The first of the latter is Favor of the Gods, which functions like domination modes where you have to capture and control points around a map to win. However, kills and opening chests contribute to your team's score as well. That way, players aren't avoiding each other but oscillating between objectives and player hunting to get the edge they need. It encourages moving around beyond capturing points to keep players tense and occupied. I didn't get to experience this mode with the scant player base, which makes the exclusion of bots disappointing for those who want to practice or play solo, but from watching matches, I think it's safe for me to say that it's a great blend of deathmatch and domination with maps scattered across locations from the saga, such as the Labyrinth in God of War 3 and the Bog of the Forgotten from God of War 2. 
Every arena has unique environmental hazards, platforming portals, and even background enemies that can disrupt combat if players get too close. You could say the small joys in solving puzzles is transferred here in the form of springing traps on hasty foes. A clever way to capture a feeling from the core experience in a new way. There's a level of craft and attention put into these levels that make it plain why Santa Monica abandoned ship. They're densely packed with layouts that come across more like playgrounds of death that are fun to explore and exploit. Favor of the Gods is the greatest attraction that invites several playthroughs with each of its five big maps. You can also play on some of the same maps and different smaller ones with Trial of the Gods. This mode pits you against waves of increasingly harder enemies, either solo or co-op. It's Ascension's answer for the lack of a challenge mode, though once you beat all that it has to offer, there isn't much reason to return unless you're really just starting out or you're desperate for XP. Favor of the Gods is where it's at. But if you're looking for a simpler time, there are deathmatch and competitive team modes to play that will test your skill and your ability to work with friends. I didn't stand a chance in the short matches I played because I would open myself up once only to be caught in an endless combo. It's similar to what happens with players who slip up in competitive fighting titles and tournaments, but it can be annoying since God of War has always been about constantly being on the offensive and recovering quickly. So for a newcomer like me, it's really frustrating. Perhaps an unavoidable consequence. Nonetheless, these modes are fun for a time with quick spars if you can master an allegiance. At this point, it's like asking me to participate in a Smash Bros. tournament. Now, I'm really good with my big bad boy Bowser. That heavy is my main, and I will hold my own and body anyone who tries to fight me as my main. But I I'm, I'm still going to die. My decimation at a tournament would be so devastating. It'd be like me disappearing from the annals of history as if I never existed. So, if you're going into Ascension thinking you're gonna do okay, I got news. It's gonna take a while. <laughs> Combat is similar to single player gameplay with a far broader range of abilities to toy around with. Differences include the inclusion of sprinting and a more classical take on the rage meter that allows you to use your grappling hook as a powerful weapon for a short time. What makes the multiplayer difficult is how rolling and parrying will leave you vulnerable to punishing grapples and heavy attacks, so you can't be spamming these moves like you would against AI. There's never been greater risk or deliberate intention to combat as there is in Ascension's multiplayer, but the gameplay is still accessible and it's still simple. And that means that fights start to blur together and feel shallow because there's only so many combos and strategies that you can execute, which doesn't work in this particular game's favor for longevity. Still, the multiplayer is an ambitious, commendable conversion of God of War's gameplay. Half of its modes lose their luster after completing them, but the Favor of the Gods mode and Deathmatch options can easily provide a couple dozen hours of fun if you could get a group of friends together that are craving classic God of War. Honestly, I think the idea would prove successful today as a standalone multiplayer game. If Santa Monica ever considers returning to the old formula, I would be all over an experience designed from the ground up that actively provokes strategy and cooperation. Can you imagine combos that can be executed in tandem with a teammate to take down NPCs and players? A deeper parry system and more weapons to switch to? Competitive QTEs even more fleshed out than Gears of War's simple button-mashing chainsaw fights? I mean, I can still see why people play Ascension to this day because, like I said, there's nothing quite like it. And I'd wager that Santa Monica, let alone Ready at Dawn Studios, you know what I'm saying, come on back to God of War, could deliver on Ascension's original ambitions and then some. Imagine a spinoff in Norse mythology before humanity's disappearance where you're fighting for the gods across the Nine Realms. I'm just throwing it up there. Good spinoff potential! 
Now that you understand how much of an investment in resources and time this mode took for Santa Monica, how much did that adversely impact the campaign? Let's find out. Six months. It's been half a year since Kratos unwittingly murdered his family. Ares realizes that he may have been mistaken in believing the Spartan could be his greatest warrior, so he tasks the Furies to soothe his paralyzing grief with illusions. These primordial beings are supposed to be servants of Hades, but have pledged their loyalty to the god of war so they could bring an end to Olympus together. The Furies' purpose is to eternally punish those who make and break oaths to the gods, but under Ares' sway, they condoned his decision to deceive Kratos. It was an offense to the justice they were supposed to uphold that Orkos couldn't stomach. He decides to secretly help Kratos break free of his mother's influence and start him on the path to freedom from his father. Yep, Orkos is their son, a failed attempt to create the warrior that Ares desired before he discovered Kratos. But this isn't how Ascension starts. If I thought Chains of Olympus was an unusual style of story for the franchise, Ascension takes the cake with a plot structure that jumps from the past to the present up until the end. The journey Kratos embarks on eventually lands him in captivity by the Furies, and like the first god of war, this end is the beginning. Kratos breaks free from being chained up and tortured by one Fury that he chases and fights through her sister's nightmarish prison built into the huge multi-armed Hecatonkeries, the first Oathbreaker. It's a setup that attempts to build suspense and falls short with revelations that feel unnecessarily held back. The first God of War had the best kind of mystery because the opening shot of him committing suicide doesn't reveal any spoilers. After Athena assigns you to kill Ares, you still wonder if he failed or not. Why have the gods abandoned him? Did they take away his guilt or do something worse? The questions pile up when you realize Kratos has a colored past with Ares and Sparta too. Why did the gods choose him to kill the God of War? Who murdered his family? Even though these mysteries are important, they don't distract from the present journey or make it confusing. There's plenty of reason and clarity to your current objectives, so the flashbacks add on top of the suspense for Kratos' seemingly doomed yet uncertain fate. Even though the dialogue is campier than other entries in retrospect, it remains an engaging, well-structured narrative. On the other hand, cutting from the present to the past is awkward in Ascension. It's hard to follow why Kratos doesn't assume his family is dead if all he sees are visions of them. How are the Furies not aware of where Kratos is if they're casting illusions on him throughout the experience? Yes, I know, it's stupid to dwell on plot holes with something as over the top as God of War, but really. Even something like that can have suspension of disbelief broken, and Ascension is an example of that. I mean, I would have preferred had Ascension been told in an entirely linear progression past its introduction. How about the Furies not only mentally, but emotionally manipulating Kratos all the way throughout the experience? Why split up the ending throughout the entire experience if the in-media res introduction only works for the, well, introduction? <laughs> Illusions are rare and only come in the form of some enemies and cutscenes, even though Kratos confusingly remarks, How can I defeat the Furies when all I see is illusion? It would have been fitting to integrate his fight back to reality through gameplay as you progressively break free of their psychological shackles, making revenge all the sweeter. One of the greatest moments is when Tisiphone, one of the Furies, pits you against Spartan soldiers. There's also a boss battle where you kill her, only to discover you've bested a doppelganger. Even in combat with the Furies, there's no actively shifting environments or trickery, yet bosses like Zeus and Perseus from prior entries made use of these neat ideas. My point is that the story tells you about Kratos' illusion while your experience with him paints a different picture. In other words, illusion is a periphery matter compared to simply breaking the blood oath to Ares, when the frustrations and dangers of it should be the driving force behind why you want to pummel the Furies. Only at the very end does Ascension peek into the enthralling madness of being in the illusions that Kratos speaks of. 
instead of only relying on a few cutscenes in the final boss fight to convey this struggle, it should have been an integral part of puzzle solving and platforming throughout the whole experience. For example, the Eyes of Truth are an item you obtain within the last hour that disrupt illusions hindering your way. But it would have been better had this been given to Kratos from the get-go to slowly subvert and master fiction in conjunction with reality to progress. Gosh, I'm thinking about the evil within and how I did this masterfully by putting the players in a constant state of unease because you never really knew whether you were in reality or fiction. Picture Kratos exploring a Grecian village and at random he suddenly finds himself in an alternate reality of Hades where he has to face intense enemies, timed platforming, and grotesque puzzles to escape and get back to reality. It sounds awesome. This is the earliest time in Kratos' life. So even though he shrugs his shoulders at the god of the underworld by the time of God of War 3, I think circumstances like this would have been perfect to break down Kratos and unveil the underlying insecurity and fear that motivate his rage. Perhaps in conversation with Orcos as they work out their shared experiences and feelings and tragedy. I tell you what, I honestly might have teared up after the credits rolled if they had developed a believable, deeper friendship. On top of that, there's the use of characters from his past during cutscenes that show how Kratos had a more soft-spoken tempered side. It's effectively jarring in light of who he is now, but these moments are few and far between and come at the expense of action that starts to wear on you towards the end. It's a strange thing to admit with God of War, believe me, but it's also hard to imagine some of the stunts he pulls off as a mortal here. Not to mention how I wanted to see more of his faults exposed with more naturally occurring, quieter moments that Ready at Dawn pulled off rather well. Wade and Sony wrote about how the story's execution was hard to figure out. Quote, As we closed in on finishing the game, we decided to retain our primary focus on the game's biggest moments, those epic moments and set pieces. Unfortunately, this came at the cost of narrowing our storytelling vision. We're proud of so many moments in Ascension but the finished game did miss many of the storytelling ambitions we had hoped to deliver to both ourselves and our audience." End quote. Even though there are some cringy line deliveries and cutscenes with the introduction of motion capture, I am the queen of the furies! I do like the characters in themselves. Orcos is a genuine, upstanding guy who plays a tragic yet compelling role in Kratos' life. As I mentioned above, I sorely wish he had been more present, since he's not only an original invention of Santa Monica, but also one of the only friends the Spartan shows genuine respect and compassion for. I also love how the Furies clash in their goals, but again, there are missed opportunities to delve into their hatred of Olympus and involve Ares in the plot. After all, there has to be a reason why he doesn't pursue Kratos to the ends of the earth after breaking his bond. What stops Ares from killing him? Maybe he fears Kratos from a hypothetical encounter? Perhaps the Olympians became involved with this whole debacle, which led to Zeus's rule that the gods weren't to fight each other? I'm practically writing out the story for you, Santa Monica, and it is heartbreaking that none of my dumb ideas happen in the story. Like, again. I want you to picture Orcos helping you throughout the entire story and becoming one of your best friends. Only at the end, after Kratos kills the Furies, Orcos has your blood oath still. But he wants to prove himself to his parents that he can do something right and live up to who they want him to be. So he's the last boss. And with tears streaming down his face, he looks at Kratos and says, I'm sorry, my friend, but I have to do this. I hope you understand. I died. I give up. It's, it's horrible. That's why Ascension is far from pointless with its rich premise and characters, but it squanders them all nonetheless. As a side note, I will say the music would have fit right in with a better story. 
There's a great assortment of beautiful and heart-pumping pieces from composer Tyler Bates. His score has a noticeably slower tempo that tones down the stereotypical bombast, but he definitely retains the heavy male choirs and percussion that musically define God of War. Moving on to the combat, Ascension is actually a contender for having the best in the series. It faces a similar problem to Chains of Olympus since Kratos can't be going around touting a godlike arsenal. Santa Monica commits to that with nothing besides the Blades of Chaos. Instead of worrying about the ever-present issue of weapon balancing, they are moved to the problem entirely, for better and for worse. The absence is rectified with the rather innovative idea of picking up swords, spears, hammers, shields, and slings scattered throughout the world one of the most obvious influences of multiplayer. I like how you can wisely use them to soften up particular foes quickly or toss them out to stun huge ones that you can use to your advantage. Despite these strategic affordances, it's a shame the weapons are one-trick ponies instead of being ones you can switch to with different combos until they break or something. It's a clever idea that I just don't prefer replacing more complex weapons that stay with you, but this makes way for emphasis on the blades like never before. Santa Monica extracts the latent power of the blades with the tethering mechanic. It's mapped to R1, which has only been devoted to environmental interactions like opening chests and shoulder bashing across titles. This time Kratos can throw out a blade like Scorpion, so instead of having enemies get over here, he gets to them. Come here! It doesn't possess the same dangers as tackling enemies in Ghost of Sparta or grabbing one up close to ram others in God of War 3 because it's fast. You can even execute simple attacks with your other blade while tethered. The mechanic also removes the need to sprint or roll toward enemies to grab them, so the blades are more practically applied beyond juggling grunts during combos. This is Kratos' iconic weapons at their most satisfying. And even though the tethering mechanic can be a crutch to exploit during fights with lesser foes, it's fun to assess the battlefield and use it when the time's right, since you can toss enemies, sling them around like a bludgeon, and more. The grab mechanic is a melee now that lets Kratos briefly stun and crouching enemies with a punch or kick. It's a good change to stun enemies up close. The one change I don't like is how parrying is akin to Dark Souls. Yes, I made the comparison, allow me to explain. <laughs> Instead of pushing the button just before an attack, you have to bring up your defense and press X before the blow lands. This makes parrying in the thick of a combo or group of enemies impossible, because there are two steps rather than one. Not to mention more enemies to pay attention to at a much farther distance in God of War than in Dark Souls. This small design choice is much more detrimental than you'd think for combat flow, because if you're about to take a hit, you have to absorb it with L1 and wait for an opening with a follow-up attack. The first God of War provided a small way to parry attacks with a late-game move called Hades Revenge. It was poorly implemented then, but it was something to gently lessen the constant game of stop-and-go with movement. In Ascension, Tethering invites you to dive into the fray. Heck, enemies, though lower in quantity than usual, are more aggressive with bigger pools of moves. The devolution of parrying violently works against these advances. There's even this bizarre animation where Kratos falls and gets back up from certain attacks, which occurs often and costs precious health since you're needlessly exposed. I bring it up because it's a comparable, small thing that proves to be way more frustrating than it should be. Magic returns to its roots with Kratos being blessed with the power of gods. Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, and Ares bestow Kratos with their respective elements of lightning, ice, soul, and fire. Instead of themed special moves alone that take up magic, the elements also add small foils to combos and yield different orbs. For instance, lightning accumulates blue orbs, magic, and can shortly stun targets, whereas soul grants green orbs, health, and sends out small amounts of, well, souls that inflict residual damage. You can do a move that sends out a ball of electricity or two devastating waves of soul energy, and I'm still not done. The rage mode has been changed to a meter that builds depending on your performance. If you don't get damaged for long enough, you can activate another magic ability to send out a five second stream of lightning, similar to the Eye of Olympus and Ghosts of Sparta, 
or spawn a flurry of souls that eat away at foes. Technically, there are eight magic moves total, two for each element, which makes this game feel like a thorough upgrade of the first God of War's magic system. Did I mention none of the aforementioned moves take up any magic? Only the AoE attacks expend magic, and even though they're simple button presses, they're really fun to pool off in the middle of overwhelming odds and chaos, as if Kratos stomps down his foot and says, I will not tolerate you enemies anymore! <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, I'm very intimidating, just like Kratos. You will not disagree with me! All these things sound great, but there's not much reason to switch elements with the exception of AoE attacks because Enemies aren't weak or immune to particular elements. It's another puzzling oversight, because some enemy types seem made for weaknesses, but aren't. I still switched often for the magic abilities, though, but did more so out of whimsy than intent. There are two items as well. Both of them run on cooldown timers, no item bar, and are very useful. The Amulet of Uroboros, yes, not Uroboros, I had to check myself a couple times, slows down time around a target, and the Oath Stone of Orcos summons a clone of Kratos that briefly fights alongside you. I don't really have much to say about their application in combat as I do their wonderful part in puzzles. I can say, without a doubt, that Ascension has the most varied, thought-provoking puzzles in the saga in spite of not using illusions. Good mechanical puzzles are a dime a dozen, but you'll be manipulating cool, complicated machinery and devices throughout this game. The items play into the puzzle so well, since you can heal or decay objects to adjust one part of a device to pave the way for fixing another part of it. You need to think carefully about timing and placement with the Oath Stone, so you can have your clone hold levers for you or stand on platforms in your stead. Puzzles come across as deeper and bigger than usual with one that requires you to move around and backtrack through several rooms. There's more backtracking to the point where I realized Santa Monica finally took its original inspiration of Legend of Zelda to heart. The puzzles don't match the sprawling complex designs of that series or a similar competitor like Darksiders, but Ascension shows the level designers at their best with puzzles. The same can be said for the platforming. Hmm, sort of. The game takes a page from Ghost of Sparta and throws in the sliding mechanic with obstacles and cool camera angles to involve the player more. Opening the Temple of Delphi is one of the best examples of platforming as you activate and ride across three giant mechanical snakes to turn this massive gear. There's a ton of suspense and action happening, but the actual platforming isn't as diverse and, on the bright side, removes fluff like climbing across ropes and beam balancing. Even the series' staple of wall climbing with the blades isn't present, which has been switched to hand climbing that automatically moves Kratos across walls with the occasional jump you have to initiate, similar to Uncharted and Assassin's Creed. It's an unneeded change with how platforming works, but I'm okay with it. Sometimes platforming will come to the forefront in Splendor. Other times, it recedes into the backdrop of gameplay until I almost forgot it was there. I have confused thoughts with the art direction. I was in awe with exotic areas like Delphi that has a captivating clash of verdant trees and waterfalls amidst snowy mountains that you get tours of by riding those mechanical snakes. I also talked about how the puzzles are more mechanically minded, and this applies to their appealing visual design as well. All the contraptions you come across are gorgeously assembled marvels. There's unexpected wild opposition too, like anthropomorphic elephants and Amazonian warriors. And if you're wondering how elephants can be in Greece, it's because much of the game takes place in or close to Persia. There's a greater focus on more saturation, realism, and letting go of constraints for the sake of fantasy. I like what lead environmental artist John Palomerchuk had to say. Quote, During research, we discovered they didn't have arches back in Kratos' time. That means no circle architecture. Visually, it's more interesting to have arches, so we made a decision to have them because they make stuff look better." End quote. As a result, the artists really shine in this entry with the places you explore because they had creative freedom. However, these settings fall prey to the remnants of the accursed Brown Plague of late 2000 games. 
I'm reminded of Chains of Olympus since browns, tans, and blacks dominate environments with only a couple anomalies like Delphi. The impressive detail gets lost in the bland color palette, including Kratos during several combat and platforming sections. That brings me to the camera work. I've never had a problem with the programmed cinematography. Ascension gets it right more often than not, but there are unforgivable zoom outs that had me fuming. This ain't gonna cut it. We gotta go for more drastic measures. Some design is at its best when it's not noticed, and this is the first time Santa Monica fumbles with its otherwise perfect camera record. As for bosses, the game actually starts with a Kronos-like battle with the Hecatonkeries. Isn't he supposed to be dead with a prison complex integrated into his body? Well, one of the theories brings him to life with these parasitic bugs that transform his appendages into monsters. What ensues is the most insane introduction to any God of War game, where buildings are morphing and literally fighting against you. You have to see it to believe it. And while I don't find its execution as memorable as Kronos, it's filled with exciting moments where you're tossed and turned all about. Other than that, evidence of skimping because of multiplayer is evident since there are only four other bosses. One of them is more of a sub-boss, but the remaining three are some of the most complex in the franchise, much to my surprise, with my favorite being the conjoined pair of Pollux and Castor. This unusual pair seems to have no end to the tricks up their sleeves since they teleport, cast magic projectiles, and alter the floor you're dueling on. You've got to give your undivided attention to this busy fight, and the same goes for fighting two Furies at once, twice. I was getting Ornstein and Smo vibes with how they protect each other and make you cautious about making moves. These battles are nowhere near as punishing or methodical, but in God of War's scope, they're among the most unique and surprising in the saga. It's no question these words define Ascension as a whole, really. But should they be framed in a positive or negative context in light of all the things we've discussed? One thing I've had to learn as a critic is when personal fatigue conflicts with games that have objectively fine design. A perfect, prescient example of this is Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Sledgehammer Games' World War II scratched a nostalgic itch for boots-on-the-ground gameplay that hadn't been around for a while, so the game kept me around for much longer than usual. But just because I think Treyarch's next multiplayer project seems like a watered-down expansion to Black Ops 3 that will bore longtime fans, I'd heartily recommend it to newcomers, since the gunplay, operators, modes, and maps capture the best parts of the third game without becoming a gymnasium of wall running and double jumping. I think this critical approach is found lacking in hasty judgments of ascension that even colored my own attitude settling into it. After playing through five games in two months, I could feel the same fatigue that many players must have felt in 2013. You can tell Santa Monica was stretched for time and creatively spread thin for an addendum to their supposed finale too. The story is ill-conceived and unsure of itself despite a phenomenal premise and cool characters to work with. The concept of illusion is a painfully missed opportunity to bring a memorable edge to all of the gameplay. Elements of combat are also dragged down with new parts and changes that shouldn't exist. 
It's almost like you can feel Santa Monica was getting tired of God of War as well. But even if that's true, there's a lot to love about Ascension. The flaws that mark combat obscure how Kratos' blades have never felt better to control with a brilliant tethering mechanic and rehauled magic system. Illusion's lack of influence over puzzles may be a sad waste, but they're easily the most challenging and fun in the series. Other than these obscured positives, Ascension boasts an acceptable assortment of exciting boss fights, grand set pieces, and decent platforming you'd expect. Oh yeah, and there's a whole multiplayer mode that's actually worth taking a spin with for a spell. <laughs> there's a lot to say about Ascension if this review hasn't been any indication. It's a whirlpool of God of War's elements at their worst and best, and thankfully the latter wins out in the end because I think Santa Monica is incapable of making a bad game. Ascension is anything but that, even in spite of its scars. Ghost of Sparta, do not turn your back on me. Once in your pathetic life, don't fail. Don't fail her like you failed your family. Ah! 